you talk about um, building your sales team from one to 50, you got to think about the three S the first five, the foundation yep. in the future. Um, let's walk through each one of those bullets. If you don't mind, um, why don't we talk sure. about the, the first five first? And actually, you know what, if you want to tee this up at all, that's fine. But I, I want to hear about the three F's for building your sales team from one to 50, cause it's an excellent framework. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the way I was thinking about it when I kind of look back and break it apart is really, you know, figuring out the right people for each stage, like, cause it evolves and it changes. And then, the, the customer journey changes as you mature and the, the deals get bigger and you move more into the enterprise. And so you kind of have to chunk it up and, you know, hire the right people at each stage, address the customer life cycle at each stage, remove friction points. And so, you know, the biggest thing for, for me early on was um, you know, getting the right people in the boat uh, early. And fortunately for me, my first two hires, two salespeople that one is now a manager for me in, in Amsterdam, the other one's the top rep in, in the U S um, still here, uh, which is good because right before I took the job, uh, Mark Roberts from HubSpot, a buddy of mine, um, called me and he was like, I need your two best, if you're on speed dial, who are your two best salespeople? And I gave him these two names because I didn't have a job. And they both got offers from HubSpot and they both turned them down. And <laughs> it, 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 thankfully, Roberts was like, what the hell? I'm like, I don't know, man. And uh, so then I got a job, I got the job with the division a month later and it just worked out. I called both of them. I was like, you guys are on the team and, oh, you know, awesome. once, and, and it ended up working out really well. And I think the, uh, you know, back to the first five, I think some of the important traits for those folks early on is they weren't necessarily just salespeople, right? Like they, they were product managers almost at that stage and, and they just, they knew the product inside and out and, you know, without having, you know, proper, you know, you know, sales engineer support or any of that product support on calls. Like it was a little bit of the wild west and we had to do our own thing and envision couldn't be further at that point, especially couldn't have been further from a sales culture. Like right. it was a free product, free value to everybody designers. You know, it wasn't a push market. It was full and pull motion. It was all bottoms up. And so we were definitely a little bit out there trying to figure it out. And so, you know, hired these folks early on um, that really could, you know, talk to the customer, understand their understand their 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 concerns and, and their process and their journey. And then ultimately we built the sales process around that. Right. And the other key thing about those those first people are you've got to get the people that are on the boat that want to join a company at that stage for the right reasons. If you want to make a lot of money as a salesperson, start up like Envision at that stage and start that's not the right place. Right? It's just not go work with Salesforce. Right. And so um you need to find people that are there because of the opportunity, right? They, they want the career opportunity. They want to be co-owners and building something. And that's what, you know, the early folks at the, and on the sales team, I actually think to this day, we still hire people with those, with those profiles, the people that were still in the overall, hopefully trajectory of envision, like it's still early. And um, um, that was really critical to find people that wanted to join for the right reasons and not just purely on the financial side. And so getting those builders in early, the ones that can have those, and the product conversations that was really important for us early on. Very cool. Yeah, I think in one of the um, in one of the talks you do, uh, you talk about uh, focusing on key traits: resilience, adaptability, yeah. and fighters, uh, and yeah. then focusing on key motivations: opportunity, vision, and ownership. Those six things I think are so important. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I would say resilience is probably the biggest one because at any startup you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have so many challenges. And so, I mean, I've even made some. You know, I've even made some, you know, decisions where we've hired people that have had really good runs at really big companies and their resumes are, you know, great. And you hire them to a place like Envision and it doesn't work out and they're not ready for it. We probably hired at the wrong time. The people that are better off, like I even tell our recruiters, are like, go find people that had a big run at a company at a really successful company, then went to a startup that ran out of money or a startup that went out of business. Totally. Fell off a cliff. Gotten, and, yeah. And they've gotten their nose bloodied. And they know what it feels like because your nose is going to get bloodied at a startup inevitably at some point. And so you need the people that can take the punches and be resilient and battle through that. And not only can do it, but want to do it. Right. And some of the folks we hired, like, they just don't want to do it at that stage in the career. I don't blame them either. Right. You know, and so um, you just got to figure out that profile and make sure that things like resilience that uh, uh, is so important for those uh, for those early hires. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's incumbent upon the person hiring them to help yep. those salespeople to make that decision. Like oftentimes you don't know that you need to go get your nose bloodied or you need to go have a failure somewhere else. After your first jump from an organization, you've had a really good run or a long run. Like you have to go yep. get that, you know, that, that failure. You have to go learn and have that learning experience. Like it is incumbent upon the person hiring those individuals to help those individuals realize whether or not it's the right time in their career to make the jump into yeah. that startup or not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, that was really important early on. And then the only other thing was, you know, I talked about is finding all of those friction points early. So, you know, mapping out that customer journey and figuring out why aren't people buying a product? Is it the price? Do they not trust you, not know who you are? Do they not want to sign up for a long-term commitment? Is it particular features? Like whatever it is, you've got to map that out and then start to figure out how do you remove each one of those and address each one of those. And that's really important early on. And that'll evolve. Once you move into the enterprise, you're gonna have different friction points and you have to readdress them. Security and things like that will start to come in a little bit more, you know, uh, overtly. But early on, like just why don't people have the product in their hands? and do everything you can to remove those friction points to get the product in their hands. Yeah, awesome. So th there's a couple of examples that you use in some of your past content. Like if price is a friction sure. point, using free trials and freemium, you know, getting the product into their hands uh, with free trials. Seeing the product yep. in action, doing group demos you talk about, understanding how they use it, pre-populating the assets and pre-populating the, uh, the product, lack of trust yep. in your brand, building customer testimonials, long-term commitments to a product and you know, offer an opt out, just get them on board. Yep. And then lack of features, you know, sharing the roadmap for the product team from the product team, getting them involved with that journey and setting them up, setting the customers up with the product team to help, you know, evolve that journey. And I thought the examples you use and the solutions to them, I think those are extremely valuable as you're thinking about each one of those different friction points, both as you get started. And sometimes you don't solve those problem points with those solutions that you just talked about until mid stage, late stage in building sales team. Yep. So Sorry to, um, to, to, to kind of like, you know, steal some of that thunder, but I thought you've talked about this a bunch of times in the past and using those examples. Yep. I think that that's really valuable for people and, and um, that's just great content. So you did your homework. You did your homework, Brandon. Hell yeah, brother. I'm always doing my homework. It's all about the prep in my world. Uh, so yeah. you got, that's first five. Um, now let's talk about foundation. Yep. Yeah. And so the foundation is sort of when you you know, really want to start building out the process. And that's when, you know, like I said before, like that's when it's really important to uh, hire operations, right? And, you know, because you're going to start to build out the, those leading indicators that I talked about, about what, the, what, are those, what are those activities that you want to measure? Because again, at this stage, it's less about the results, right? I know the results are important, but you really need to figure out like all of the specific activities and that'll lead to a potential success. You can start to understand like what are the what are the points even in the sales process that you need to that you're struggling with, and how do you you know and and, and these aren't these aren't things that are meant to beat the team up on right. There's always like this head trash. With people are like oh I don't want you to measure how many meetings I have a week. I don't want you to measure how many prospecting calls I'm doing. Whatever. And it's like it's not the point. The point is not to like manage you out if you're not doing it. The point is to help identify the coaching opportunities for the managers to say okay you're not able to get people to respond to your emails like let's go through those and evaluate you're not getting enough meetings like let's look at some of your other outreach like you're not converting meetings to opportunities let's go through your talk track in those meetings like they're 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 guidelines and they're guidelines and they're really they're coaching opportunities yeah, is what they essentially are diagnostics exactly yeah exactly exactly and so you know building that foundation the other thing you know for a specifically for a company like envision is really on is you know, how do you offer value beyond the product? And, you know, I'm really sort of incredibly lucky and proud about what we do at Envision because we offer so much more beyond the product. But that's really important early because to some extent you need to build the trust and the credibility with your customers when your product doesn't always fulfill every promise. And that buys you time. And especially early on, that's really important. So even with the sales team, you know, I never want somebody to prospect and try to set up a meeting with talk about a vision product. It's like offer something with value, piece of content, whatever it is, but like offer value to somebody all the time. And you can, there's opportunities to do that beyond the product. I mean, just a quick, a quick thing. I mean, our CEO is, is brilliant marketer. And one of the things that we did is we made a movie. Um, you know, even when I first started, uh, Clark was like, Hey, we're making a movie. I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, we're making a feature length film on design. It's like, you're crazy. And, 
we hired this production company out of New York and flew around the country. And we made a feature length movie called Design Disruptors. And it was a intimate look at companies that were using product design to disrupt entire industries. So Google, Airbnb, Netflix, uh, all of these, all of these companies. And we made this awesome movie. We, we weren't in it. Vision wasn't in it, but it was brought to you by Envision. And so what we did was we did a world premiere in San Francisco, um, Castro theater, red carpet press, like oh the whole gosh. deal. Oh my gosh. And we had, this is so cool. V- VIP dinner after. Then we did one in New York and we did one in London. And, they were huge. And then what happened was the we were like, all right, we're going to release the movie. But then people started emailing us and saying, hey, how can we do a screening here? I want my executive team at Uber or at NBC or at Salesforce to see this. And so we sort of weaponized it. And we didn't release it to the public. And we said, all right, if you want to do a screening or at your community, you know, wherever, like, we will host it. And I think we've probably done 500 screenings across the globe at this point. You name a company, we're doing we're doing one next week in Europe with a company. And what an opportunity to one, reach out to somebody and say, hey, we've got this incredible story that will help your management team understand the value of a design-centric approach. It's super entertaining. Why don't we come on, have some drinks, get a couple hundred people in the room, whatever it is. Sometimes we'll even do a panel. We'll get people and product leads. We'll do a panel discussion after the movie. And it's been such a great, uh, vehicle for us. I mean, now we have a full, we have a whole film team now in Vision. We did a documentary with IBM uh, called The Loop on their process, you know, celebrated and, and, you know, evangelized their process, which, you know, sort of strengthened our relationship with IBM, but again, offered value to the community, which the movie had ultimately did. Like it was a free offering for us to the community. Here's some really good content, best practices, examples in an entertaining format that we are going to deliver to you as part of what our brand represents. Now we're, we've got a new movie that we're releasing this fall um, and uh, it's been incredibly successful. It's just another example of like, how do you go ahead? Not everybody can make a movie. I get it. But although I've seen some good copycats over the last six months or last year, uh, it's coming, it's getting out there. But Clark Valberg, this is yours. It was, a, it, was a, it was a really powerful vehicle for us. Nice. Very good. And so you talk about adding value beyond your product. Um, you talked about focusing on behaviors and activities. You talked about some of the, the activities. And you talk about um, also your, um, you're hiring your first layer of management. You talk about hiring coaches, yes. coaches and not managers. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I just feel like early, early days, you just, you, you need folks that one are, you know, they're not about coming in as manager for, for kind of title reasons. And you get people in there that are really good at coaching because that's what's critical. Using those leading indicators, using those behaviors and activities, finding those opportunities to help coach the team. Um, and that's why you can like your first sales director or whatever it might be, like they've got to be a really good coach because it's going to be all about, you know, the, the failures and the misses early on and the objections. There's going to be so many objections you're going to face, whether it's product price competitors, whatever it is, like you really need to figure out how do you coach the team on overcoming those. And so that's why it's really important from a profile perspective that you really dig in when you're interviewing in terms of. You know, talk me through uh, talk me through an example of where you identified something with a rep and coach them through it to an improvement. What was the result? Like those types of things um, are really important when you're sort of building that 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 foundational team. Nice, awesome. Okay, so that's the that's the that's the first five that we just talked about foundation. Now let's talk about future. Yep. Yeah, and 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 the only other thing that I'll mention on the on the on the, on the foundation now that you're you're kind of bringing up the the topic, but just one of the things that we did it interesting at Envision was it's so important to understand your customer and like everything about their customer. And this, this evolves at every stage. And so uh, early on, like I, I hired one. And so I hired a designer onto our team instead of a sales engineer, I hired a designer. And so this person, this person came on board, still with the company is great. Um, but just gave that credibility to the sales team in terms of the day in the life of what a designer deals with. And could hop on calls and give us some credibility in terms of, you know, talking to designers, which is a very unique persona to sell to, right? They don't like to be sold to, right? They, they want to touch and feel the product, learn about it, and then use it. And if they like it, they'll tell their friends about it. But so, you know, figuring out who your customer is and then hiring them uh, was really important as well. The other thing that we do now, which is an interesting um, kind of nuance, is around understanding the customer. We now have a program called uh, Delicious Empathy. Every person at Envision, anywhere, again, fully distributed 
uh, companies with people all over the world and anybody at the company from operations to sales to finance has the ability to take a designer out to dinner once a month and expense it. The only rule is you're, the only rule is you're not allowed to talk about a vision. So it's just about, again, building those relationships, understanding kind of the motivations, the personal motivations, even of your customers. And, and that just feeds into everything that we believe in and do as a company. And so that's been another kind of, you know, interesting thing for us to do um, across the company to help people, you know, build empathy with, with our customers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. You call it, uh, I think you call it relentless focus on the customer and is yep. there, I, it's a pretty, pretty cool example. Delicious empathy. <laughs> I love the the pun. Delicious doesn't take people out to dinner. That's good. I, uh, I'm, I'm not yeah. usually a laggard on, on the, on the jokes, but uh, that was a good one. Uh, <laughs> and let, let's talk about future. Um, so you talk about a foundation, yeah. a f- about a foundation for building the future. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So the future is, is, um, you know, I, I feel like at this point, this is where, you know, you built it, built to a foundational team. You've got some infrastructure in place. You're moving into the enterprise. Like this is when things will break. Like things are going to start to break and you've got to kind of revisit the overall customer journey. You've got to revisit the, you know, the, the friction points, you know, as you move into the enterprise, things like legal process, you know, security, all of those are going to be new friction points that you're going to have to learn how to address. And this is also, you know, in in a lot of cases, this is also when you make that shift from a transactional product focused sale to the value based one. And that's when you've got to hire a different profile of of salesperson at this stage. You've got to evolve your motion at this stage. And so, um, you know, now is kind of when you're, when you're really selling and, you know, you've got to get people that are, you know, again, stewards of your brand, like along all of this, like your brand is so important these days that just, I think people sometimes underestimate the impact of hiring the wrong salesperson on their brand. And like, you got to think about like, is this somebody that you would want in a room with 15 of your prospects or customers, which is someone you would want presenting at a community event on behalf of your brand? And if the answer is no, they're probably not the right person. Even if they're the best seller in the world, because they are a representative of your brand. And you've got to create that value through your, your salespeople and that, that it represents the value that you want to project, project in your brand. So that's really important. And the other part about, you know, at this stage is you've got to find people that are really good storytellers, right? And that's so important. Um, can they still a story? Because at this point, people don't really care about your product. Like this is when the transition switches on the customer side as well. They don't care about your product. They care about what the promise of your product can deliver. They care about the results. They care about the examples of what other customers have done to drive tangible business value from the product. And so there's that shift. And this is where you, know, you don't need the, the product experts in the sales team. This is where you can introduce things like sales engineers or more, you know, you know, product specialists or whatever it is to fill some of those technical gaps. But this is where you need people that can actually tell that story and sell the dream of what your products and more importantly, what your brand represents. And that's really important at this stage as you kind of build out the team. 